Welcome to Math Mini Lessons. My name is Sarah. I'll be your math coach through this review session. And we're going to be looking at the seventh grade 2022 state math test for New York. And these are released questions, meaning these are taken from the New York State Education site. They do not release the entire test. Some questions will be taken out. And during this video, I'm gonna go over all the different questions that were released. The best way to use this video is to download your own copy of this exam. And it will be on, if you go to the State Education Department website, nisedregents.org, you will see it up on the top part where it says elementary school you can click here and you can find release questions for mathematics and under 2022 i am using the seventh grade exam and you can just hit release questions and you will get your own copy of the test so you get to scroll down and you will see a copy oops a copy of the exam it has the reference sheet this is what you get to pull out it's, and rip off and you can have it on the side of your notes. You can use a calculator on um, both days of the exam. So use it during this practice as well. And you'll be able to see all the different types of questions. And if you scroll all the way to the end, there is an answer key and it tells you about the different types of questions as well as what percentage of students answered it correctly. And at the end for the open response, it tells you the average number of points that students earned. So for example, 42 is a two point question and the average score was 1.32 out of two points. So that was the average. All right, so let's jump back and go into our practice part for today. Here is how the test is designed. So I'm using the 2023 test design, meaning this is what this year's test is gonna be like starting May 2nd and May 3rd. Um, similar to last year, there are two days of the exam, day one and day two. Uh, day one is all multiple choice, meaning you'll have 32 multiple choice questions. And on day two, you will have six multiple choice questions. You're gonna have three one point questions, which is new. This does not happen last year. That's new. You're also going to have six two point questions and one three point question. We're gonna talk about what has to be on the page. You can't just have the right answer and no work. So what demonstrates you understand how to do this work. And so all together you have 48 questions for this exam. Here are the types of questions you're gonna get based on the five different domains. You'll notice the smallest part is geometry. That's because the rest of geometry is taught after the state test. And the biggest portions will be EE, your algebra, and your ratio proportions. These two sections make up at least half the test up to ooh, almost up to over 70% of the exam. Wow, that's a huge chunk of the test will be based on those two. And the smallest portions will be number sense and ratio and probability. And notice these are ranges. So it could be anywhere between 24 and 33%. So I'm just letting you know, at least half the test will be based on these two. And I'll try to identify those types of questions as we keep going. All right, so take a copy of the test yourself and use this video by going through it and I'll show you what the answers are. And if you get it right, just skip over to the next part. You can put question marks next to the ones you really wanna go over, to, over or stars where you wanna just make sure. And if you have a different answer, watch and see how I got my answer. There are other strategies, but the answer part is correct. And try and identify, well, what was the, the type of error I was making so you don't make that error again. And you can use a calculator, so I will have a calculator out during different parts to practice, but I'm always gonna show my work on the page. So get your work out, and we'll get started with the first page. Here are the very first two problems. You can see the answers already highlighted. If you have them correct, keep moving on. If not, let's go over. So for number one, it is a probability question. So stats in probability based on the weather report probability it will rain is 0 0.13 hundredths which word describes the likelihood it will rain okay 
So with probability, you can represent it on a number line from zero to one. I'm gonna put 1.00 so we can see it. And I'm gonna put 0.50 as the 50-50 chance. Now, anything at exactly zero is going to be a never, it's impossible, unlikely. Not even unlikely, it's just impossible if we get to the zero. Anything that's at the 0.50, it's you have an even chance you have like a 50 50 chance it could happen could not happen it's that that in between part and if something is at exactly one or 100 percent, it's certain it will absolutely happen so anything within this range over here that's on this side anything greater than than 0.50 but less than one is likely and the closer, the closer you get to one, the more likely it is. And anything that is less than 0.50 and approaching zero, so the closer you get to zero, the more unlikely it is. So 0 0.13 would be somewhere around here and is much closer to zero. Now, other things I want you to just know, they sometimes use this number line with percents. So one would be the same as 1%, 50 would be the same as 50%, and 1300 would be the same as 13%. So all those things, be ready for probability be written as a fraction or a percent or a decimal. But there you go, that's why this is unlikely, it is 13%. It's not impossible because impossible has to be exactly 0% and certain has to be exactly one or 100%. All right, let's go to the next one. Two stores each advertise a discount on the same type of watch at both stores. The original price of the watch was $35. So that's important, the original price. Store A discounts the price of the watch at 20% and store B at 15%. How much less is a discounted watch at store A than at store B. Okay, so first thing I'm gonna start by just naming this part. I'm gonna have it as an RP question, um, but it's also, there are some EE skills that pop in. So I've seen, I've seen both. I've seen people use this as a ratio problem and use the percents as ratios, 20 out of 100. Um, but I'm actually gonna use EE skills to solve this one. We know the original price of the watch is $35. And if I take a discount of 20%, I'm only paying 80%. How am I getting that? Because I'm discounted 20%. So 100 minus 20 gives me 80. And in the second discount, you get a discount 15%. So you're paying the rest 85%. So we're gonna look at the difference between the two stores. What is store B minus store A? So the price of the watch at store B minus the price of store A. To figure out 80% of, store B has 85%. Um, if I wanna know what is 85% of $35, because that's the price I'm gonna pay, I'm gonna do 0.85, turn into a decimal, times 35. And to figure out the price at store, the other store, 80%, it would be 0.80 times 35, times the original price. So that's how I'm structuring it. This is the percent I want, I want 85%, and this is the original price, okay? So that's all I'm doing there. So let's use our calculator, 35 times 0.85. There we go. So the, the new price is 29.75 at store B and 35 times 0.80 is $28 at the other store. So if I subtract both of those, I get a difference of $1.75. Okay. 
here are your answers for four and for five. And we'll jump in with four. First, you have a spinner that has five equal sections colored blue, red, orange, yellow, and green. The arrow is spun 50 times so on the experiment. The results are shown on the table. Based on the results, what is the experimental probability um, that any one spin the arrow will land on the red section? So we are looking for the probability red and this is experimental based on this experiment. So we know that it landed on red 15 times. So this was the result out of 50 trials. So outcome out of all possible events, 15 out of 50. And you'll notice you're not going to see 15 out of 50 there. You see a 15 here and that's what makes this a distractor. So if you don't see it, just remember you do have to simplify. And I'm going to simplify this by a common factor. 5, 15 divided by 5 is 3 and 50 divided by 5 is 10. So that is how you get 3 out of 10. So that is the chance that it will land on red based on this experiment. Let's go to the next one. This was an SP. Next one is an EE problem. Which expression is equivalent to this whole expression? All right, so I'm going to start by writing it out. Negative 3 times 2x minus 8 plus 4x. I'm going to start by distributing. And that means three groups of 2. Negative 3 times 2x is negative 6x. Negative 3 times negative 8 is positive 24 and plus 4x. I'm going to rewrite this, putting my like terms next to each other. Here are your like terms. Negative 6x plus 4x plus 24. And now that these are next to each other, I can combine them. Negative 6x plus 4 would be negative 2x plus 24. There you go. Let's go to the next one. The data set shown below represents the distribution of high temperatures in the city for eight days. So this is a statistics problem. That's some probability. What is the median high temperature? Okay, so for median, this has to be ordered. And median means middle. So I'm going to put these in order. I'm just going to scan and look for the smallest number first. So 66, 70, 72. Oh, notice that there was another 72 there. I have to write both of them. 73, 75, 79 and 81. And now I can cross from the other ends. So I want to find what's in the middle. And I have two numbers in the middle, meaning I have to find their average. So what is halfway between 72 and 73? It would be 72.5. If you want to know what I did mentally to do this, Mentally, literally, I just added the two numbers together. And then just divide it by two. Same thing. All right, let's go to the next one. How many different choices of one size, one flavor, one topping? So this is a combo. Um, or when I was younger, we called it combinatorics. So how many combinations do we have for size? Uh, for size, we have three different options. For flavor, we have three different options. And for toppings, we have three different options. So I could make 27 combinations. 
Here's your answer for number 11. The cost for 10 ounces of blueberries is 270. Actually, I want to use a lighter color highlighter. The cost for 10 ounces of blueberries is $2.70, which equation, so it's definitely an EE problem, can be used to determine X, the cost of dollars for 30 ounces of blueberries. So this is an EE question. All right, so what's the ratio we know? We know that 10 ounces cost $2.70. So here's my beginning ratio. And this is ounces to price. If I have 30 ounces, I'm gonna put ounces in the same row. And we wanna know what this price is, okay? So this is the first ratio I'm looking for. Um, but we also know it could also be, they could have the ratio as money to ounces. So if that's the case, it would still be 270 with 10 ounces and it would just be X over 30. So I'm looking for either one of these two since they didn't tell us which one it could be. And the only one that really matches is C. And things to look out for, notice the 10 and the 30 are in the same row. And that the 10 and the 270 are in the same row. The reason why A is a distractor is because the 10, the ounces, are in different rows. One is in the numerator, one is in the denominator. So even though you see the first one that's correct, this 30 is in the wrong place. Let's go to the next one. So far we haven't needed our calculator too much. Which expression has the same value as the expression shown below? This is a number sense problem. So I have negative 3 eighths minus 7 eighths. And I am writing another expression and this will be with additive inverse. Meaning, I'm going to turn this subtraction problem into an equivalent expression with addition. So I keep the first term, I turn this to an addition problem, and my second term, I'm going to find its opposite. So 7 eighths, the opposite of 7 eighths is negative 7 eighths. And we see that here. So why is C incorrect? It's really just because they didn't put a negative sign in front. So that's what made this one incorrect. They changed the first term. And let me see, why then is B, why is B incorrect? Um, they did the additive part, but they didn't make seven eighths. They didn't find this opposite. So that's what makes B incorrect. Let's go to 20. And again, if you're getting these right, keep moving forward. But if you're making an error, look over your work and try to find out where our thinking is different and try to understand what is different. What were you thinking? What were you noticing? What was you going on in your mind? And ask questions if you're not sure. Okay, this one was a little tricky the first time I tried it. A chef made 150 cups of chili and sold 60%. A serving size of chili is one and two thirds cups, how many servings of chili were sold? Okay, so he sells, he makes 150 cups and sold 60%. So we're gonna figure out what is 60% of 150. That's gonna be the, the first part. And we know a serving size is one and two thirds. So we're gonna figure out once we know how much was sold, we're gonna divide it by one and two thirds to figure out the number of servings. So let's start to figure out 60% of a number. I'm gonna turn this to 0.60 times 150. And we're gonna divide this. And one and two thirds, I'm gonna change that to an improper fraction of five thirds. Okay. So 150 times 0.60, I'm gonna use order of operations. I'm gonna do my multiplication first. Here we go. Now sometimes my calculator is a little weird. 
so I want to just make sure that it writes down the entire number there we go 0.60 times 150 so 90 cups were sold and I'm going to divide that by 5 thirds all right so we're going to to divide we keep the first number 90 over 1 and we multiply by the reciprocal or keep change flip is usually how people remember but we multiply by the reciprocal and we get 270 over 5 and 270 divided by 5 is 54 so that's how many cups so again we found out he sold 60 percent of 150 cups and that was 90 so we had 90 cups out of chili sold and every time he scoops out the chili it's he scoops one and two thirds cups so that's why we're dividing by one and two thirds let's go to the next one at sunset the thermometer has a reading of four degrees fahrenheit during the night the temperature decreased 15 per, uh, degrees fahrenheit after decrease what is the total number of degrees that the temperature must change to read zero degrees all right so telling the story it starts at four degrees it decreases 15 degrees and we want to know what is the change to get to zero um, I like to do this kind of you could have it out as an equation like this so this is possible um, but I also like making a visual so here's zero degrees so if I was at four degrees and I went back 15 what number would I stop on so from four if I, I counted down 15 I would be at negative 11 and so how many would I have to go up to get to zero from negative 11 I would just go up 11 if you did it the algebraic way then you would just solve what is 4 minus 15 you would still get negative 11 plus what number makes 0 you would just look for its opposite negative 11 plus 11 would make 0 I as a 1 works here are the answers for 25 and 26 you can see just there's a lot of fractions so you do need a lot of number sense but these are combined with an, another type of domain a gardener uses a total of 61.5 gallons of gasoline in one month of the total amount of gasoline three-fifths was used in the lawn mower how many gallons of gasoline did the gardener use in order to mow his lawn in one month so here's the simplest way I want to know what is three-fifths of 61 and 5 tenths so I'm going to do three-fifths times 61.5 notice this one um, I have fractions and I have decimals so I'm going to turn three-fifths into a decimal and it's 0.60 so now I have 0.60 let's actually write it right underneath 0.60 times 61.5 make sure my calculator is working nope we're not doing those 0.60 there we go times 61.5 and you get 36.9 so that's how many gallons I have seen some students make this into a ratio so that is another way you could do it if you wanted to know um, like I've seen some kids do three-fifths is equal to n over 61.5 and cross multiply that would be another way right by using your rates all right let's go to the next one a machine in a factory makes two and one fourth pound of nails in one and a half hours at this rate in pounds per hour how many um, does the ma machine make nails okay at what rate so we have two and one fourths pounds 
in one and a half hours. I'm going to rewrite this as a division problem. Two and one fourth divided by one and one half. Change these to improper fractions. So the first one you'll be looping this way. Two times four is eight plus one. So nine fourths divided by three halves. You're going to multiply by the reciprocal and you get 18 twelfths, which is the same if you were to change this back to a mixed number. 12 goes into 18 one time and you're left with 6 twelfths or 1 and 1 half. So there you have it. I have my rate and I actually did the division to figure out the unit rate. Let's go to the next one and you can see it skipped some questions. That's okay. This is just what's released. The table below shows the proportional relationship between X and Y. What is the constant rate of proportionality between X and Y? All right. So here's your constant rate. Y is equal to K X. So we are looking for what the K is. The way I can do that is I could rewrite this as y divided by x is equal to k. These are two ways. This is what we want to solve. So I'm going to do that with these four examples. Let's make a little to do, 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 do so we can see all four. So again, y over x is what you're looking for. So for the first one, it's 0.75 over 0.50 and you get 1.5. So the first one, 1.5 is going to be a constant rate, so it should be true for all of them. So y over x gives us k. So 1.875 over 1.25. gives us 1.1.8 whoops 1.875 let's make sure it writes it correctly over 1.25 equals 1.5 so k is 1.5 we'll go to the third one which is 4.5 over 3 you'll still get 1.5 and the last one, 10.125 over 6.75. 1.5. So there's your constant rate of proportionality. It's always just do y over x to find k. Here are the last three problems from the very first day of the test. And again, they skipped a lot of problems. They were not all released, but here you go. If you have a different answer for 31, 32, or 33, please stay on. All right, so Mr. Jensen, I'm gonna summarize some of the problem. He purchased an airline ticket on a website. The original price was 473. He used a coupon code to receive a 20% discount. A sales tax of 12% was applied after the discount. What is the total price of the discount, including sales tax? Okay, so first we're going to figure out the price after the discount. And then we're going to add a 12% tax. All right, so he got a 20% discount, so he paid 80%. So we want to know what is 80% of 473. And after we find out that number, we're going to multiply it by 1.2. 12. Why? Because this is an increase of 12%. We're not getting a discount now. We're adding on to the price. All right. So let's do the very first part. So we're going to do 0.80 times 473. And then we're going to multiply that number by 1.12. So 0.80. Make sure my calculator gets that number. There we go. Times 473. 
So he ended up only paying $378.40. So let's figure out what the tax is. $378.40 times 1.12. So $423, and it says 808. We're gonna round that up to the nearest penny. So 423.81 cents, and 81 cents. So the question you might be asking is, how do I know to multiply by 1.12? Well, any number times one, you get the same number. So that's the first thing. So the price would not change if I multiply it by one. Because it's an increase, I added the 12%. That's why I'm multiplying by 1.12. In this part, again, if I multiply 473 times one, the price wouldn't change. I took away 20% because this was a discount. So the price, it went down from 100% down to 80%. And that's why I figure out percent change. I multiply it with the change in mind. That's my goal there. All right, let's go to the next one. What is the value of this long number? So this is just straight computation, but you'll notice that you have decimals as well as fractions. So I'm gonna make a choice. Let's write this out first. I'm gonna change all of these to, what do I wanna do? I'm gonna change the first one Let's change them all to decimals. Let's do that. So 12.5 minus 31 divided by two would give me 15.5. There you go. And one and one fourth is 1.25. All right, so let's do the first one and it's a negative. So 12.5 minus 15.5. Let's make sure my decimals are popping up. Perfect. So I get minus 3 plus 1.25. This is definitely a number sense skill. And I'm going to get a negative number. My negative, the absolute value of my negative is higher. And I get negative 1.75. Now notice I don't see 1.75, I see 17.25. That is not the same, that is a distractor. So I'm also gonna change this into a fraction because I know it definitely can't be A either. 1.75, negative 1.75 is not the same as negative 20. So in fractional form, it's equivalent would be negative one and three fourths. I still don't see one and three fourths, but I notice these two are improper fractions, so let's change it to an improper fraction. Four times one plus three is seven thirds, so ne oops, seven fourths, so negative seven fourths, and that one I do see. So a lot of, they just wanna know that you can fluently go from fractions to decimals and back and forth, and that you know how to add and subtract with positive and negative integers. That's what they're looking for in this one. Notice how I use my calculator for small steps, but all my work shows my thinking. Let's go to the next one. On a map, two cities are 2.8 inches apart. The map has a scale of one inch to 25 miles. How far apart in inches would the same two cities be on a map that has a scale of one to 40 miles? So there are two things happening here. In the first part, this is gonna be an RP problem. This first part was E. Okay, so in the first part we have the two cities are 2.8 inches apart and the scale is one to 25. So I'm going to quickly make a ratio table and I have inches and miles. So one to 25 and I have 2.8 inches. So when I cross multiply here and I just multiply here and here to make an equation, I get 25 times 2.8 is equal to a number. 
I like that because that's going to be a simple one to solve. 25 times 2.8 is equal to 70. 70 is equal to n. So this is 70 miles. How do I know it's miles? Over here. So 70 miles. So that's how far away these two cities are would be. But now they're going to ask us to do a different thing. Now they ask to put this on a whole different scale. So I'm going to make another ratio table. This one is inches and miles. And here I have the scale is 1 to 40. And this time I know I have 70 miles. So I need to figure out the top number. So I'm going to cross multiply again. So you're going to multiply 40 times a number. And that gives you 40 times a number. And 1 times 70 is 70. So here's my equation. 70 is equal to 40 times the number. We're going to isolate to get the n by itself, the number. So we're going to divide both sides by 40. This leaves me with a number. And 70 divided by 40 is 1.75. So 1.75 inches. And there you go. So this was an RP problem. And that's the end of the questions for day one, all multiple choice. All right. We're going to jump into day two, take a quick stretch break, and it'll start off with multiple choice. And remember, it will then go into constructed responses. All right, starting day two, you have the same conversion chart. Nothing is different. Things to notice. You have your formulas for any type of geometry problem. We may not see all of them, but they give us all of these formulas here, and we can substitute with any EE skills and we have any conversions we would need up here. Now, sometimes we need this for a problem, sometimes we don't. But if you have it, just have it on the side in case it comes up. Okay, here are your answers for 34 and 35. The first one is an EE problem and inequality, and the second one is a statistics and probability problem, it's stats. Let's start with the first one. Caitlin wants to buy a skateboard, a $75 skateboard. Let's get my highlighter. She has $25 saved so far, and she mows lawns to make extra money and earns $20 for each lawn she mows. What inequality can be used to determine the number of lawns X she needs to mow to uh, have enough money for the skateboard? Okay, so we definitely know she needs to have at least $75 at least. That means that she can have more or equal to $75. So it could be equal to or she can have more than $75. She has $25 and she's going to mow lawns for $20 for each lawn. So there's my rate. So $25 plus 20x is equal to, is greater than or less than $75. And here it is. That's the exact inequality. It can't be A because in A, the 75 is greater, which means what she makes would be less than or equal to $75. Let's look at the second one. And you have a set, so you're, you're comparing two different data sets. And in your choices, you have to actually read them. You have means or medians. You want to know which one is true. So I'm going to give us time to figure out the median and the mean. So for the mean, we're going to add all these numbers together and divide. So I'm going to do A first. So 76 plus 68. 73, 65, plus 60, plus 63, let it get some space, plus 69, plus 76. So the total is 550, and I'm dividing that by 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Remember, even though I have a calculator, I show my work. So 550 divided by 8. And that gives me 68.75. All right, let's do the second step. So 
and that gives me 544 so it's going to be a lower mean divided by 8. And that gives me 68. Okay. So that's the first one. And that's why B actually works. It says the mean of team A is greater than team B. The first one would have been wrong. It would have said B was greater. And I know 68 is not greater than 68.75. So how do I know C and D don't work? Okay. So if you want to go that route, we would find the median. Let me move my calculator aside. Get our numbers going. All right, I'm, I would just put all of these numbers in order. So 60, 63, 65. And notice how careful I'm being. And my middle numbers, but there are eight of them, so I'm going to have two middle numbers. I have 68 and 69, so you would add them up together and divide by two, and you'll get 68.5. And if you do bottom row, again, I'm being careful. And again, I'm going to have two middle numbers. So you'll do the same thing. Add them together, divide by two. And oops, this should be a 7, 70. There you go, 68.5. So your medians are the same. And that's why C, it says the median height on one is, is greater. So nope, they're the same. And in D, the median height of A is greater. So no, they are the same. Okay, so here are the answers for 34 and 35. Here are the answers for 36, 37, and 38. So go ahead and check your answers. They're all A's. And in the first one, we have a number sense problem. In the second one, we have a unit rate, so an RP problem. And the third one has geometry and EE skills attached to them. All right, so we'll start with the first one. If you had an error on entities, just fast forward to that number. Now let's do the first one, negative 36 divided by 9 plus 3 times negative 7 plus two, and we're gonna use order of operations. And the second part to this is recognizing your negative integers, your positive and negative integers. So we know what to do and we're adding them. If they're different, we're going to uh, have some zero pairs. So it's gonna feel like numbers are, are subtracting or getting smaller. It's gonna look like that visually. And if we're multiplied, they're the same. So when they're the same, we know that they're, they're positive times a positive is a positive. If we have a negative times a negative, it is also positive. But if they're different, then there will be a negative sign. Okay, so I'm just going to go from left to right, starting off with division. Since there's nothing in a parentheses, I can simplify no exponent. Negative 36 divided by 9 is negative 4. And each time I'm rewriting it to show the simplification. Here's our next step of multiplication. 3 times negative 7 is negative 21. And now we have negative, 16, negative 4 minus 21. So negative 4 and a negative 21. So if you want to see why we add them, you can use additive inverse. So I'm adding my negatives, so I get negative 25, so I have more negatives, plus 2. Okay, and that's my final part. 
um, negative 25 plus 2 is negative 23. Let's go to the next one. A cook uses one and three fourths table tablespoons of salt to make three and a half pounds of pasta. What is the unit rate per pound? Okay, so we want teaspoons per pound. So I have one and three fourths divided by three and one half. These are pounds, these are teaspoons. So I'm going to rewrite that as a division problem. So one and three fourths divided by three and a half. Change them to improper fractions. So I get seven fourths divided by seven halves. Now what's interesting here is that I could actually do this division work. Seven divided by seven is one and four divided by two is two and get one half. Um, if that didn't register because you're so used to rewriting division as multiplication, that's great. It still works. 7 fourths times 2 sevenths is 14 over 28, which also simplifies to 1 half. It's 14 divided by 14 is 1. 28 divided by 14 is 2. And... The expression 48y minus 16 represents the perimeter of a square. What represents each side of the square? So I'm going to draw this out so we have our visual. Oh, that was a terrible square. Let's draw it again. I could do better than that. There we go. And each side of our square is exactly the same. All four sides are the same. And if I wanted to just do the area of the perimeter of a square, I could just do each side times four. Well, this problem is telling me that entire perimeter is 48y minus 16. So all I'm going to do to figure out one side is to divide each term by four. So if this is all four sides, to find one side, I'm going to do 48y divided by 4 and 16 divided by 4. Well, negative 16 divided by 4. And we'll start with the first term. 48y divided by 4, well, that means that I actually have 12y's. And negative 16 divided by 4 is minus 4. So this is what one side is equal to. And that makes a ton of sense because if you were to try it out, can you write it in blue? If you were to actually try this out and check your work, if we want math to make sense, we can prove it. So here's 12y minus 4, 12y minus 4. 12y minus 4 and 12y minus 4. So if I were to add up all my 12y's, 12y, 24y, 32y, 36, 37, 38, 38y, that was our first number. So if you add up all the 12y's and now 48y's, and if you do the same thing with our negative numbers, negative 4 minus, so now I have negative 8. I have negative 12, now I have negative 16, and there's our second one. Okay, so you can actually add it up and you can see that, that it works. So if you need the help of any of these or you had an error, please jot them down. And we'll go to the next page. Here are your answers for 39 and 40. First one seems to be an EE problem, an equation. Um, but because I see an equation, but I also know that this one is an RP problem as well because there's there's a rate component to it. And the second one below it, we're going to simplify this EE problem. So it's another one that connects to It connects algebra and it connects number sense. All right, we'll start with the first one. The equation Y equals 
4.3x can be used to determine the, the total cost of y in dollars and x in pounds. What does the 4.3 represent? So this is written in a y equals kx form. It's telling me that there's a proportional relationship here. And my 4.3, is it really is a constant rate of proportionality. Meaning, this is a constant rate. 4.3 represents a rate where the pounds times this constant rate, which is a cost, a cost rate, or a price rate. will tell me what the total cost is okay so if I have X pounds I want to multiply it by 4.3 uh, dollars per pound that's what this 4.3 is telling me it's dollars per pound watch what happens if you're still not sure why remember we talked before K is equal to Y over X that constant rate I know I'm, I'm getting into the next line. That rate is equal to y, which is a total, the total cost per pound. That is what that k is telling me. The cost per one pound per pound of apples. I've given you a few different ways to represent that. Let's look at the next one. Which expression is equivalent to the expression below? So 2 plus 3 times 2x plus 5. Love these questions, these order of operation questions. I hate people arguing about this on Twitter, on Facebook, on Instagram. Drives me nuts. So if I'm going to use my order of operations, uh, usually we say, please excuse my dear Aunt Sally my little arrow from left to right. All right, what's in the parentheses? I can't simplify what's in this parentheses anymore. The terms are in simplest forms. I cannot combine 2x and 5. So I am going to use my distributive property because this is telling me I have three groups of 2x plus 5. So let's distribute. 2 times 2x means I have 6x's. And three groups of five is 15. So here we go. And now I can, I tell a lot of kids in the beginning stages, you can rewrite this to put things that are alike next to each other. These terms are alike, so let's put them next to each other. Proximity makes it easier for us to see, oh, we're just going to add these two numbers together. So 2 plus 15 makes 17 and 6x and I cannot combine any more like terms because one is a constant and this one is a coefficient and is variable can't combine them and that's where we're at 17 plus 6x Okay, jot them down if you had any differences here. And again, ask questions if you're not sure why either of these work. Multiple choice is done. We're going to do our six two-point questions and our one three-point question. Now, for this year's test, there will be three one-point questions, meaning you have to show, um, you're going to actually show your work, show your thinking on the page for one point. You have a set of two-point questions and one three-point question at the end. This year's test did not have one-point questions. All right, let's jump in. Now, the first one is a two-point question. However, if you only have 238, you do not get full credit unless your work shows that you demonstrated you know how to find that answer. So I do have my calculator on the side. Again, you must demonstrate with your work that you understand. Having just done it on a calculator and getting an answer does not show mastery. doesn't give you full credit. So let's start off with the first one. A teacher surveys a random group of students about their preference for doing classwork online or on paper. 
the results that are shown on the table. Based on the results, how many students out of 350 will most likely have a preface to their work online? So this is an SP problem, it has to do with probability. All right, and it's also mixed with, there are some rates here too. So it's also some RP. Okay, so we wanna know the, how many students out of 350. So this is definitely gonna be a part to whole um, relationship. So I'm gonna make a ratio table. This will show, help me see the, the rates that's happening in this problem. And I wanna see how many wanna do their classwork online. So part the whole online, we have 17 kids who want to do it online. Let me write it in black so it's nice and clear. Out of how many, because I want the total. So I know in total, I have 25 students. So this is just my first ratio. So 17 out of every 25 kids wants to do their work online. I know I actually have 350 kids in all, and I wanna know what part wanna do it online. All right, so now this is again, where we're going to cross multiply. You're gonna find the cross products to make an equation. So 25 times N is 25N is equal to 17 times 350. Let's start simplifying. I can't do anything about 25N, that's the simplest form. So 17 times 350 is 5,950. I wanna isolate the N, so I'm gonna divide by 25. That will just leave me with N. And on the other end, to keep balance, I divide the other part by 25. So 5950 divided by 25 gives me 238. So N is equal to 238 students. And this is what I mean by you have to really demonstrate your work. They're looking for, can you find this rate? Are you writing the ratio of 17 out of 25? They wanna see that. Um, can you find it and make it a part to hold? And then they wanna see, can you use that information to solve for N? And there are so many different ways you can do this. There, there are many, many, many valid ways to do this. And I, this is just one way, but somehow you have to use your proportional reasoning to figure out what would N be. So for every 25 kids, 17 want to do their work online. And that's how I got 238. If you found it in another way with valid mathematically sound work, as always, share your thinking. Let's go to the next one. Also a two point problem. Marcy is buying prizes to give away at a fundraiser as described. She has $250 to spend. She buys 13 passes for 950, uh, three gift cards at $25 each, and she uses the rest of the money to buy candy bars that cost $1.75. What is the greatest number of candy bars she can earn with the money? So this is going to be an inequality. And so here's how I'm going to express that. So she has $250. Can she spend exactly $250? Yes, so it can be equal to. Can she go over the $250? So here's what, I'm gonna make an expression for what she spends, and I know she cannot go over 250. If she does, she's not gonna have enough money. So I'm gonna use this inequality. So whatever she spends has to be less than or equal to $250, okay? So let's express the first one. So 13 movie passes for $9.50 each. So 13 times $9.50. And she buys three gift cards for $25 each. So three times 25. And the rest she will use to buy candy bars at $1.75 each. So $1.75 x because I have no idea what that amount is. All right, so those are all her expenses. So 13 times 950 plus 3 times 25 plus 
1.75x because we don't know how much. Whatever's left, you will spend on that. All right, let's simplify this expression. I'm going to do 13 times 950. And again, I have my calculator, but I have to demonstrate my thinking. There should be a 5 here. There we go. So 13 times 950 is 123.50. 3 times 25, I don't need a calculator for that, is 75. And I have 175, 1.75x. Uh, Let's add these two numbers up. So 123.50 plus 75 is 198.50. You're like, how did she do that in her head? If you're ever feeling like you're doing something in your head and you just want to know where the numbers come from, again, you have your tools in front of you. So you can just use that to verify. So 198.50 plus. 75x is still less than or equal to $250. Okay, now it looks a lot more like the equation structure we're used to, which is the um, ax plus b equals c. Just so you can see, this is the structure we do a lot in seventh grade ax plus b equals c, or with inequalities, ax plus b, and there's some type of inequality symbol case we have is less than or equal to C. We're still going to get rid of this B first and I'm going to turn that into a zero pair. Okay, I'm going to put this opposite there so that this goes away and leaves me with 175x. But to keep balance, whatever I do to one side, I got to do to the other. That's going to give me, I think it's 5150, but I'll triple check with my work. Actually, I'll do it this way. Uh, just so you can see this method. I call this trade first, meaning I start from, from our left, and I ask, do I have enough? 2 minus 1, I got enough. 5 minus 9, I don't got enough. So I'm going to regroup. Turn this to 15. Cool beans. Now I go to the next one. 0 minus 8, I don't got enough. So I'm going to regroup, turn this to 14. Now I have enough, I have 10. And the next one, zero minus five, I don't have enough. Now I got enough, now I have enough for everything so I can subtract, zero minus zero is zero, 10 minus five is five, nine minus eight is 1, 14 minus 9 is 5, and 1 minus 1 is 0. All right, so just like I said, 51, 50. Last part, now we have to work with this A. We want to have only one X, so we're going to use division. We're going to divide by 1.75, because that will leave me with only one X. A number divided by itself leaves us as 1. We don't often write the 1 in front but we have the 1x that we want. And we're gonna do the same thing to the other side. This one I am gonna use my calculator for, so 51.50 divided by $1.75. Oops, let's try it again. Very sensitive calculator. There we go. And I get x is equal to 29.428. All right, now this is where we get to think. So how many candy bars I, with division I can get at least 25? I'm sorry, 29. So I can get 29 candy bars and I'm going to have some left over. That's where I put the 29. And you could always test this by going back to the beginning and trying it out. So if x equals 29. I don't have a lot of work to check, but let's say x is 29. 29 times a dollar, 75. I would have spent $50.75, so that makes sense. If x is equal to 29, 1.75x would be equal to $50.75. And you can see it right here. I would have enough money to buy 29, but I don't have enough money to buy one more. 
and because I would only have 75 cents change. All right, so that's what they're looking for here. They're looking for, can you write an inequality? That's the first thing. Can you represent this problem as an inequality? And then can you solve for the inequality and contextualize your answer? How do you make, what is the variable in the context of this question? In this case, it was how many candy bars I can, I can buy. And I can't buy 29.4 candy bars. I can buy 29 and the rest of my money is just left over. So hit pause and jot this down if you have a different answer. And we'll go to the next one. At a, at a company, a copy machine prints 175 pages in five minutes. If the number of pages printed is proportional to time in minutes, what is the unit rate? So I, if this was 2000, 2023, this would probably be a one point question. So here's our rate. We have 175 pages in five minutes. This is an RP problem. Uh, so I just want to find the unit rate. So I'm going to do 175 divided by five. That's it. And I get 35 pages. That's all it is. 35 pages in one minute. Nothing else. If you wanted to do it with a ratio table, which you can, you would have just done this the same thing, 175 over five is equal to one, and you want to know what this number is, you still would have gotten 175 is equal to five N, and divided both sides by five, and gotten N equals 35. Same thing, so this one is pretty straightforward. Let's go to the next one. A cook removes a package of food from a freezer that begins to defrost. The initial temperature of the package is negative 15 degrees. At noon, the temperature has increased 35 degrees. What is the total change in temperature? Okay, so I'm gonna represent, here's our number line. Here's zero, we were at negative 15 and we're going to increase 35 degrees. So I'm definitely going over zero to the positives but I am not going all the way to 35 because I'm starting at negative 15. So here's one thing you could do. You can split this up. And if you just added 15, you will get to zero. So you have 20 left. So if you did another 20 degrees, because these two would equal 35 degrees of change, you will get to positive 20. Okay, a cook removes a package of food from the freezer begins to frost. The initial temperature, so this is our starting temperature, is negative 15. At noon, the temperature of the package has increased to 135, so that's important. So increase to 35 degrees or increase by 35 degrees. These are very, very different. I'm going to just show you why. So here's increased to 35 degrees. And this is increased by 35 degrees. I'm going to draw a number line for both. Here's zero. They both start at negative 15. So if I increase to 35 degrees, that means I'm going to get all the way over here to this number. So here's the start. This is the start. This is the end. So I would want to know. How do I get from here to here? How much did the temperature change? If it's increased by 35 degrees, then that's saying the change is 35. So if I jump 35 degrees, where, what number do I end at? So that matters. Here they're asking for the total change. So we're actually going to increase to 35 degrees. This is what we're doing, this problem over here. Okay, not the one on the side, this is incorrect. But I can see a lot of kids making that error, just to be fair. All right, so let's go over it. I wanna know what that changes. I'm gonna use my zero because so many kids go, oh, from, I've seen a lot of kids go, well, 35 minus 15, and they go, oh, so it changed 20 degrees. I've seen a lot of kids do that because they're just using those numbers. That's an error. 
what I'm going to do is I'm going to use my zero. So from negative 15 to zero, just to get to zero, I have to go 15 degrees. And to jump from zero to 35, it increases another 35 degrees. So the total change, it went up 15 to get to zero plus another 35 to get to positive 35. So my total change is 50, 50 degrees. Another way you can do this is to go 35 minus negative 15. And when you solve that, you would actually get a 50. So I'm going to do 35 and negative times, I'm going to turn this to positive 15 and also get 50. But I, also, I find that this is the easiest way using a number line. If you're not sure, you can see the change by just drawing it out instead of writing the negative and distributing the negative. Um, for some kids, that can be very complicated. Both methods work though. Here you go, 50 degrees. All right, let's do the next one. The members of a school club are selling tickets to a fundraiser. The goal is to earn $50 each day. All right, the list shows the percent of gold for each day. On the first day, she earns 90% of their gold. So I'm gonna represent that as 90%. So 90% of $50. So that was day one. On the second day, they earn 6% more than their daily goal. So it would be like one times 50 if it was exactly 100% of their goal, but they actually did 6% more. So I'm gonna do 1.06 times 50 would represent the second day. And on the third day, the members earn 14% less than their goal. So again, 14% less if I have one, 14, um, if I have 100 minus 14, that gives me 86. Here's 86% of the goal. So how much money did the members earn for all three days? So I'm gonna add all, all three days up. So I'm gonna do day one plus two plus three. So 0.90 times 50 was day one plus 1.06 times 50, that's day two plus 0.86 times 50 for day three. And I can see here, this is a 10% decrease, so this is 90%. This is a 6% increase, because I've added 6%. And this is a 14% decrease, because I've subtracted the 14%, okay? All right, now we can just use our calculator, so 0.90. times 50 times 0.9 there we go 45 1.06 times 50 so it's gonna be over $50 Second day they made $53 and the third day will be less than $50. Such a sensitive calculator. Right, let's see if it oh, so frustrating. All right, 50 times 0 0.86. There we go. Okay, and now I just have to add these up. So on the first day, on the first and second day, we get $98 plus 43. 98 plus 43 is $141. So that's what they're looking for. They're looking, can you represent percent change in a way that makes sense? And this is just one way. I find that this is the simplest way to represent percent change. So if, if it's an increase, I'm adding it to one. I'm adding the percent there as an increase. If it's a decrease, 
I'm subtracting it, the percentage from one. And remember, whatever that percent is, I'm turning it to a decimal so I can find it. And once I have that, I'm representing it as that percent change times the original number. So original number, original amount times percent change. Is it going to be higher? An increase would be more than a hundred, more than one, a decrease lower. All right, jot this one down. And again, there are other ways to solve this. I'm just giving you the more uh, very efficient way to solve it. All right, here's another two point question. A student incorrectly simplifies the expression the expression and the student's work are shown below. In which step did the student first make the error? Be sure to include the correct value of the expression in the simplest form of your answer. So not only do I have to find the error, I have to include the correct answer in my answer. Okay, so looking here, the very first thing they did, I'm doing five minus 40 over five. So what did they do? They decided to try to turn this into an additive inverse. How do I know that? Because they have, I can see they tried to do adding and they tried to change this to the inverse. Problem is they put a negative on the 40 and the five and that just would have turned this into 40, a positive 40 over five. So additive inverse, incorrect. I wanna make that super clear. The error is in step one. The student tried to rewrite the expression in, um, with additive inverse. but negative 40 over negative five is not the inverse of 40 over five. Both are positive. The actual inverse is negative 40 over 5. All right, so that's the error. Instead of just doing the actual inverse, it turns to a negative, only the top would be negative. The fact that you would have a negative divided by a negative, that would have made it positive. So now I can also show my work. I'm going to correct it. So in the first step, it is five minus 40 over five. Rewrite it to five plus negative 40 over five. Now I'm gonna simplify what's inside the parentheses. Negative 40 over five is negative eight. And five plus negative eight is negative three. The final solution is negative three, not 13. Yeah, and you can see how that, that changed the whole answer because once I turned this into a positive eight, that was her error. She got a, a positive 13 instead of this being negative eight, which would have been the value. All right, so jot this down. And again, that they were looking for all that, that you found the error that the error was in step one, that the error was in the way they wrote the additive inverse of 40 over five, and then you had to show the correct answer with your solution. So I followed through. Here's another two point question. So these two things have to be on the page, the equation and an answer at the bottom, and you have to show your work. So they are looking for your valid thinking. Miss Boy spent a total of $175 for four tickets. 
and for parking at a baseball game. Okay, so this is another one of those AX plus B um, is greater than or less than um, is equal to C forms. The cost of each admission ticket was the same, including tax. The cost of parking was $25. So that's our constant. So we're going to write an equation in AX plus B equals C form. So the cost of parking was $25. That's our C. That's our, sorry, that's our B. That's the constant. We, we definitely got this. We know the total was $175. So that part is our C. That's our second equation. And we have four tickets. But we don't know how much each ticket costs. So that's our, our first part, AX. So I'm going to put four times a certain number of tickets. That's our A. That's our rate. Okay, and I use that to write the equation. So this represents the tickets with our unknown. This is the parking. And this was the total. And you can see it's written in AX plus B equals C form. And you're going to see this a lot in eighth grade. All right, so now they just want us to solve for X. So they want to see that you know how to solve a two-step equation. So again, I always start with B. I'm going to turn that into a zero pair. And I keep balance on both sides of the equation. So whatever I do to one expression, I got to do the other. So 4X is equal to 150, and then I'm just going to divide by 4. So that leaves me with X. 4 divided by 4 is 1X, or just X. And a dollar, 150 divided by 4 gives me 37.50. And then I can check my work, which I highly recommend. And just plugging in, just substitute your number. And you will get 4 times 37.50. You will do that work. And you will get 150 plus 25 is equal to 175. And yep, that is true. 175 is equal to 175. Again, it's a place, just check your work. You'd be surprised how many small errors you can find by just checking your work again. So here we go. This is a two-step equation, so this is an E, E problem. And here is our very final problem, is a three-point problem. So we're going to have a lot of work. Usually you'd have two pages to kind of show this if you had to continue your work somewhere. A company manufactures water bottles. The list describes the number of water bottles. So in February, they sold 4,100 uh, water bottles. In March, it was 7% more water bottles than February. So I would represent that as 1.07 times 4,100. And in April, there were 500 more water bottles than March. Okay, so I take whatever March is and I'm going to add 500. So 500 plus whatever March was. So what is the percent increase? This is where it gets tricky. What is the percent increase to the nearest percent in the number of water bottles the company manufactured from April to um, from February to April? Okay. So let's look at what happened in April. So we know February, February was uh, 4,100. Let's figure out April. So 500 plus 1.07, so a 7% increase of 4,100. I'm going to simplify. I'm going to use my order of operations to do the multiplication first. And so I have 500 plus 4,387. 4, and so I have, when I add them up together, I get 4,887. So this is April. 
Okay, so how much of a change was that from February to April? So this is where, again, I can see two different ways kids can approach this. Some kids will go in and figure out, well, what is the change? And they will put um, change over the original amount. Okay, so you can do that. And so it went from 4,100 to this. So I could see some kids doing this and saying the change was 787. And so they would have 787 over 4,100. So if you did that, 787 over 4,100, you would get 0 0.191, which rounds, if I turn it to a percentage, 19.1% or 19%. So you can do change over original, and you find out what that number is as a decimal, and you just change it to a percent. Okay, and I just around it. That's one way you can do it. Another way you can do it is by using your ratio table. And we want to know the change. We know this is going to be more than a hundred, um, hundred percent. So the original was 40, 100 that represented 100% that just equal. And we actually have four, eight, eight, seven. So we want to know what this number is. So I can see some kids doing this to figure out well, how much, what percent larger is it? And they would cross multiply and you would get 41. Oops, let me put that in there. 4100N is equal to 4,887 times 100. And so I can see kids doing this and then dividing both sides by 4100s. All right, so 48870 zero divided by 4100 and you get n is equal to 119.1 okay so let's put that in context that means that this number represents 119 percent of the cost so what percent change was that there's a change if i took out the original 100 percent you would have a 19% change. So the second way, if you did a ratio table, is a little bit more complicated, but both ways work. And this is how I get 19%. So co very complicated problem. So for these three points, you have to actually demonstrate that you know how to represent April and somewhere on your page. And so my work shows that. So I have 500 plus the 7% increase of 4100 so somehow you have to show that you can find april it has to be somewhere on your page and once you find april you have to show that you have a valid way of finding the percent change so i've just given you two there are others and that's it math marvels that was the very last question of day two as again these are thinking questions you have as much time as possible so there is no need to rush really make sure you keep all your thinking visual on the page um, and there are going to be some things that that will seem challenging that's the point it is a challenge it's meant to be challenging but absolutely try your best having at least something on the page to show you're thinking you can get partial credit and if you have other questions or thoughts or things you want to practice by all means put it in the comments ask if you want to see certain videos i'm happy to always make more um, and to help you out during the test and for next year as well that's it for today, Math Marvels. You got this. I will see you in eighth grade. Be well.